It's time to break down the Buffalo Bills divisional round opponent, the challenges they present, what the Bills need to do to deal with them today on Locked on Bills. You are locked on Bills. Your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. Happy Wednesday to you, and thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day. And as a reminder to you, we are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. It's Bet Online, and it's where the game starts. Well, folks, today on the podcast, we are going to turn our attention to the Bills matchup with the Cincinnati Bengals. And obviously, just a few weeks ago, I did an entire comprehensive primer in preparation for the Bills Monday night matchup in week 17 against the Cincinnati Bengals. And so with us having done that recently, I do want to attack this primer from a little bit different angle. I want to just examine the Bengals on offense, the Bengals on defense, talk about what they do well, talk about their problems, and my general thoughts for the Bills as they match up with Cincinnati. Now, before I really dive into this analysis, I want to take a second to take a deep breath and just remind everyone to enjoy this. I feel like everyone's so tense right now. Obviously, we're very hopeful the Bills can go on a deep run here, go to the Super Bowl and win the whole damn thing, but take a second and enjoy it. You don't have to be tense. The Bills will do it or they won't. Have fun. Football's supposed to be fun. There's a lot of good things about this Buffalo Bills football team. They have the second longest active playoff streak in the NFL right now. The Chiefs are number one at eight years. The Bills number two at four. That is it. Nobody else has made it to the playoffs the last four years besides the Chiefs and the Bills. The Bills are in the divisional round for the third straight year. Three straight years with at least one playoff win. Only seven times in the NFL history, right? Seven teams in the history of the NFL have gone five straight years with a playoff win. I don't know how many have made it three. I don't know how many have made it four, but I can tell you only seven ever have got to five. I don't know how this is all going to end, folks, but take a moment to enjoy. We have a really, really good football team that has a really good chance to go win the Super Bowl this year. Have fun. And with that said, the Buffalo Bills are at home for the divisional round of the playoffs, playing host to the Cincinnati Bengals. The game will be played on Sunday, January 22nd, 3 p.m. Eastern time at Highmark Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. The game will be broadcasted on CBS. Jim Nance on the play-by-play, Tony Romo, your game analyst, and Tracy Wolfson, the sideline reporter. That is a broadcast group that the Bills have seen a lot this year, and I I expect that to continue to be the case for future years. This will be the 33rd all-time meeting between the Bengals and Bills. The Bills have a 17-15 and all-time mark against the Bengals. The Bills are the number two seed in the AFC playoffs. They're 14 and three. The Bengals are the three seed. They're 13 and four. The winner of this game plays the winner of Chiefs and Jaguars. Both of these teams are hot. The Bills have won their last eight. The Bengals have won their last nine. Now, before I really dive into Bills defense versus Bengals offense and Bills offense against Bengals defense, I want to take a second and share a few thoughts on the first matchup that we saw, what, like nine minutes of the game, something like that. I think the Bengals had two and a half or one and a half possessions. The Bengals or the Bills had the ball one time. And I'm not sure there's a ton that you can glean from a very, very small sample size, but there are some things that I want to mention. The first thing that I want to mention is that the Bengals told us a lot when they won the toss and chose to receive the football analytics will tell you that 
your chances of winning a football game goes down when you choose to receive the football, right? They made a choice. Teams very commonly almost always defer in this era of football. The Bengals said, no, we want the football. And what do they do on that first play? They uncorked a deep ball to Jamar Chase right at Tredavious White. The Bengals are a very confident football team. If you listen to them talk, if you see the way they play, they play a confident brand of football. And then obviously they scored on the Tyler Boyd touchdown reception, which was an an incredible route and an incredible throw by Joe Burrow for the score. And so offensively from the Bengals, I think we saw just a very confident group that wanted to go out and throw the football and see if the Bills can keep up with them. That's what they said they wanted to do based on their actions in that brief Monday night game. The other thing that was interesting to me in thinking about that small sample size is Sean McDermott took the points, right? He didn't go for it on, I think it was fourth and three after the Beasley drop. They went for the field goal and didn't didn't feel, for whatever reason, they didn't feel the need to go for it and try to go for a touchdown on that drive. They were satisfied with the field goal, which is an interesting choice. I think Sean McDermott has told us over the last several years that he's an aggressive coach. And so I don't know if it was a situation where he wanted to take the points or that he felt confident taking the points and that they'll be able to score as the game went along and that they felt like they could make the right adjustments to not need to be overly aggressive in that moment that early in the game. But something that at least stood out to me is that he took the points and didn't try to go for the fourth down conversion there. And the last thing that I'll mention here is we only saw a very small amount of that game. And there's obviously a big difference between your scripted plays and your unscripted plays. Typically, the first 15 plays offensively are scripted plays. You choose to go into the game with this script and do these things, and um, from there, you really adjust, right, based on what the other team is showing you. And we didn't get deep enough into that game to really know how it was going to play out. And we've seen the Bills, especially on defense, struggle early in ball games this year. Right, I think they're 23rd in the NFL this year in first quarter defensive DVOA, and they're I think they're top five or top three in the other three quarters. The Bills are a team that adjusts very, very well, especially on defense. And I think the Bengals adjust very, very well on defense as well. But I think offensively, that may be something that Cincinnati doesn't do as well. We've seen them hit some lulls later in games this year offensively. And so Maybe it looked like the Bengals had a a lot of momentum, a lot of confidence, but we didn't see enough of that football game. We saw, I mean, we had three, almost three and a half quarters, right? We probably had 80% of the game left to play. There's no way that you could really come away with a whole lot. But I think if you do try to extrapolate important details, it's that the Bengals were confident. They wanted the ball. They went right after Trey White. They obviously scored. It looks like they were humming again on offense. And the Bills made a choice to take the points when they had a chance to score. And I thought the Bills moved the ball well on their one drive, but obviously it was a situation where they got to the red zone and didn't score a touchdown. So just thought it was useful to share some of those thoughts coming out of that brief sample size. And now we can get into the uh, the rest of the meat and potatoes of this preview for the Bills matchup against the Bengals in the divisional round. But first, I am really, really excited about our new new partner and sponsor of today's podcast, the mobile game Ultimate Football GM. Have you ever dreamed of becoming an NFL GM and managing your football franchise? Well, your dream can come true, and this game is definitely for you. You manage every strategic aspect of your team. You play through the season and lead your team to glory. You're responsible for hiring the right coaches and coordinators, trading players, making draft picks, navigating your franchise through free agency and the draft with all the ups and downs of a season and all this in a challenging and realistic game world. Football, Ultimate Football GM is completely free and playable offline. Play on the go as you want to and when you want to. We have a league for our locked on hosts. We're having a blast. I've heard from a lot of listeners 
You guys are having fun too. In fact, Locked On Bills listeners can get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On in the game store. That's Locked On. So make sure to check it out today. To download the game, just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up in the app stores. That's ultimate-gm.com. Ultimate Football GM. Start your dynasty today. Let's look at this matchup through the lens of the Bills' defense against the Bengals' offense and start by acknowledging what the Bengals' offense does well. And you start with Joe Burrow, their quarterback. He's an elite NFL quarterback. He gets the ball out quickly. He gets it out on time. He's accurate to all levels of the field, and he has all the intangibles and makeup as of a true franchise quarterback. All the things that we feel about Josh Allen in Buffalo, the Bengals feel about Joe Burrow in Cincinnati. A great fit for their organization, for their city. They've rallied behind him. He's been awesome, and he's an outstanding player. There's no question. The Bills are facing an upper echelon, top-tier quarterback, right? And what's interesting about his production to this point is that, and I said this the last time we got ready for the Bengals game, is there, there's just not a whole lot of intricacies to their passing game. There's not a lot of play action. There's not a lot of RPO. There's not a lot of screens. There's not a lot of deep passing. It is a rhythm-based passing offense. Joe Burrow reads it, and he rips it, and they have a lot of success. That's what they do. Pure drop back passing West Coast, get the ball out on time, and it works for them. Now, if I was a Bengals fan, I would be really interested in doing that with all the other stuff that helps passing offenses in terms of your play action game, your RPO game, some you know free access throws, screens, all that type of stuff. I would be very interested in seeing what those layers could mean to my offense and make a dynamic passing Offense even more dynamic, but for the most part, this is a straight drop back passing team. And I think that speaks to the quarterback that they have and the wide receivers that they have. So first things first, Joe Burrow is an elite NFL quarterback. Big challenge for any defense is, of course, the Bills on Sunday. Number two, in terms of what they do well, is they have exceptional weapons in the passing game. Top three receivers, probably the best in the league. Jamar Chase. T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd. Chase and Higgins both on rookie contracts. Tyler Boyd, the veteran of the group that's been around for a while, and he compliments these guys really well as, as a slot player. Not to mention a very good receiving tight end in Hayden Hurst and two running backs in Joe Mixon and Samaj P. Ryan that they throw the ball to a good bit and has been a successful part of their offense. So these guys have a legitimate arsenal of weapons that complement each other well and fit into this traditional drop back passing game. Accurate quarterback with those receivers, they can throw it well. The other thing that they do very well offensively that I want to point out is they're very good in terms of situational moments, third downs in red zone. The Bengals were third in the NFL in Third down conversion percentage on offense, 46%. They're fifth in red zone scoring percentage in terms of touchdowns, 65% of the time. So you you have a lot of situational efficiency when it comes to those money downs in those money moments, third downs and red zones. It's good offense. Now, what are their issues? They got issues. Their offensive line is an issue. They have a ton of injuries right now. We all know that right tackle Lyle Collins is out with a torn ACL. He suffered that on Christmas Eve. They're acclimating to Hakeem Adenogy, excuse me, as their right tackle right now. Their right guard, Alex Kappa, he had an ankle injury in week 18. I don't know if he's going to be able to go this week. They sounded like it was a multi week injury. It, it has been to this point. We'll see what happens, but that's a notable loss for them at right guard. At left tackle, against the Ravens in the divisional round, or excuse me, in the wild card rank game that they just played, he dislocated his kneecap. Would seem very unlikely that he can play on Sunday after suffering his dislocated kneecap. 
And so that's three starters. That's their left tackle, their right tackle, and their right guard that I think there's a good chance they won't be able to have at their disposal on Sunday. So what does that mean for their group? Well, Jackson Carmen will likely be their left tackle. He was a second-round pick last year, started four games for them. Cordell Volson will be their left guard. He's been their left guard all year. He's a rookie out of North Dakota State. I think he's a good young player, but still a rookie. Their center, Ted Karras, that's their preferred starter there. I think he's an adequate starting level center in the NFL. Their right guard in place of Alex Kappa, Max Sharping, who's an experienced player. He was He's in his fifth season. He started 33 games in the NFL. He's a former second round pick for the Texans. A lot of, I think all of that starting experience has come with Houston and now he's with the Bengals and he's their likely to be their right guard on Sunday. If Alex Kappa can't go. And then the right tackle being Hakeem Adeniji third season, he started 16 games. So on one hand, you, you look at this and feel like this could be a major issue for Cincinnati uh, timing based passing offense. But I'd also wouldn't assume that these are just a bunch of slugs that can't play. There's some high picks. There's some depth players with experience. And this is a team that went to the Super Bowl last year with all kinds of offensive line issues, right? That was the big story. All the times Joe Burrow was sacked and pressured in the playoffs, well, they did that right to the Super Bowl and probably had a strong claim to win that game. And on the other side of the coin, the Bills, I think, have not done a great job of taking advantage of undermanned offensive lines this year. The latest example being the Miami game that they just played. That offensive line was in shambles. Did the Bills' defensive line fully take advantage of that? I don't think so. How many times have I sat here on this podcast and told you this is the player that they can expose? This is an inexperienced backup, not their preferred guy. The Bills should be able to have some wins there. And how often does that not wind up being the case? And so I'm not going to assume here because they have these backups in there that the Bills are going to just make it so that this offense can't function. It's a challenge for Cincinnati. It's an advantage for the Bills, but I'm not assuming anything here. Those are high picks. In some cases, being Sharping and, and Carmen, those are both second-round picks. And Hakeem Adeniji has played 16 – he started 16 games over the last three seasons. So something to be mindful of, but the Bills have to take advantage of it. So what are their issues? Well, offensive line, I think, is first. And number two is that their run game has been non-existent this season. 29th in yards per game, 29th in yards per attempt. Their last four games, they've rushed for 53 yards, 73 yards, 55 yards, and 51 yards. Now, they won all of those games. They've – this – uh this lack of a rushing offense hasn't really been prohibitive to winning, but I do think it does make them a one dimensional team. And they just haven't had a lot of volume or success running the football this year. Joe Mixon's a good running back, but I don't think their run blocking has necessarily been very consistent this year. So their issues are offensive line and run game. So some closing thoughts that I have on the Bills' defense against the Cincinnati offense is, number one is you're going to have to win at the catch point. And the Bills have been really good of late winning at the catch point, and I think that has to continue. Kyer Elam, I think a big X factor in this ballgame. I want him on the field. Whether it's against Jamar Chase or T. Higgins, Kyer Elam and Trey White is going to be your best combinations of, of corners to match up. And those guys have your best ball skills. Of course, Milano, Edmonds, Taron Johnson, your slot player, and the safeties are the safeties. But I want my best ball skills on the field. And obviously, Kyer Elam has the physical skill set to match up with Higgins and Chase. I'm not sitting here telling you that they're going to eliminate either player, but I think from a physical skill set perspective, this is the player that gives you the best chance in terms of size athleticism, and ball skills. Play Elam. But at the end of the day, this is a team that is willing to test leverage. Burrow is an accurate quarterback. They have receivers with good ball skills, and so you're going to have some moments where you're going to be 
Challenge at the catch point, and the Bills need to come away with some wins. Number two is that the defensive line has to win. You have to win. You have to show up and make plays behind the line of scrimmage. You have to get pressure on Joe Burrow, get some negative plays, and win up front. You'd like to think that with the talent you have, even without Von Miller, if Von Von Miller was playing in this game, I think he would feast. But he ain't coming through those doors on Sunday afternoon. But you still got talent. That's been the point that I've made in the absence of Von Miller all year long. Greg Rousseau, first-round pick. Shaq Lawson, first-round pick. Epinesa and Basham, second-round picks. Ed Oliver, top-10 pick. Tim Settle, a guy you paid a contract to. Daquan Jones, I think, has been terrific this year. Hopefully Jordan Phillips can come back and play. He's a second-round pick. You have talent. And they have to win on Sunday. You have to win up front. And then number three is your defensive backs, really your your entire defense, but especially your defensive backs, are going to have to tackle well in this game. Those players, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Hayden Hurst at tight end, even Mixon and Pirine, those guys are all physical football players. Jamar Chase might be the strongest receiver in the NFL. He loves to catch the football and dare somebody to tackle him with physicality. He's not a finesse player. He's not going to, you know, sh- be shifty and elusive and, and juke you out in space. He's going to run you over. Be ready for that. They're going to be physical with you. You got to meet that moment. You got to match that physicality with your defensive backs. You saw the way they were playing. Hayden Hurst, T. Higgins, those guys were bringing it after the catch. You got to match that physicality for four quarters. Oh, by the way, the Bills' defensive tackling has been really good of late. For as much criticism as I've given to them this year, which was warranted, and over the last several years, the last three games, the Bills have tackled really well. They've only missed 10 tackles the last three games. That's exceptional. Most games, they missed 10. Only 10 in the last three. Three against Chicago, four against uh, the Patriots, three against Miami. Keep that trend up. That's going to give you a real chance to limit their production because Chase Higgins, Hurst, these guys want to get the ball and they want to run people over. Well, tackle, meet the moment, and say that you can be as physical as anyone. Set the tone. Be You be physical. But this is going to be a physical football game, and you have to match that and set the tone. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From pro football to college basketball to boxing, the NHL and NBA, they've got it covered over at Bet Online. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those too over at Bet Online. They are always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting information. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. It's Bet Online, it's where the game starts. Let's look at this game through the lens of the Bills' offense against the Bengals' defense. What do the Bengals' defense do well? They do a lot of things well. It's a good group. First of all, I think they provide multiple looks and adjust well. Lou Anarumo, their defensive coordinator, might be the best game plan defensive mind right now in the league. And they're so multiple with what they do from a coverage perspective with their fronts. Good group. Good group in terms of their scheme and their coaching. And number two is that they're extremely talented. They got really good players at every level of the defense. Up front, their defensive tackles, B.J. Hill and D.J. Reeder. Those are big, big athletic players that can rush and they can obviously defend the run. I think D.J. Reeder is one of the best nose tackles in the league. Hubbard and Hendrickson on the end. You know, They're both kind of playing through some injuries, but they're highly effective players. Their depth has gotten a lot of experience this year in Cam Sapple and in Zach Carter and Joseph Asai. You know, they've they got to play a lot of football this year through some of the injuries that they've had. And, you know, I think they've gotten better as the season moved along. Second level, they got two 250-pound linebackers that can run, play downhill, cover. Logan Wilson and Jermaine Pratt, those are good football players. Safety tandem of Jesse Bates and Von Bell. Jesse Bates is your ball hawking center fielder. Might be the best deep ball defender in the game right now. Von Bill, a physical player that tackles well, that can fit the run. He can be part of the run fits. Mike Hilton's an incredible slot corner. 
I think they have some issues at corner. We'll talk about that in a moment, but this is an extremely talented defense that is well-coached and makes great adjustments. And that's a lot to deal with. They've also been taking, the, taking away the football well of late. They've forced 11 takeaways in the last four games. They have two four turnover games in their last four. That should be somewhat concerning for a Bills offense that has been generous with giving away the football. This Bengals team has done well to, to get some takeaways lately. And they also they just generally make it hard on quarterbacks. This season, the Bengals have allowed a passer rating against their coverage of 80.1. That's the lowest in the NFL. Quarterbacks are not playing well against the Bengals for the most part this year. So it's a big challenge for all the reasons I just mentioned. So what are their issues? What, what, uh, what problems do the Bengals have on defense? Well, I think their weakness right now is cornerback. They have a rookie in Cam Taylor Britt out of Nebraska starting over, you know, Chidobi Awuzie injured, hasn't been available for most of the season. And now Cam Taylor Britt has had to step in and play. And I think he's been up and down. I think he's going to be a good player in the NFL. If you remember during our draft conversations, he was a guy I hope the Bills would draft on day two. And I think he's going to be a good rock solid starter for the Bengals, but he is a rookie and he can give up some stuff. And I would be interested in challenging him and seeing what type of production you can get. Their other corner is Eli Apple, who has been a highly vulnerable player his entire career. This season is no different. He's giving up a passer rating of 103.7 against his coverage this year. For his career, it's at 100. And last time I talked about the Bengals going into the, the matchup on Monday night, I know that Bengals fans listen to this podcast and they filled up my Twitter mentions and YouTube about defending Eli Apple. Well, folks, maybe he hasn't been the world's worst player, but he's a vulnerable corner. And if you're a team that's looking to come up with a plan to go up against the Bengals, you're going to want to test him because testing him has worked for every team throughout his entire career, an average of 100 passer rating against his coverage. He gives up big plays. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's a, a, a complete slug out there and can't play, but he's he's a player that you can test and have some success with, which has always been the case with Eli Apple throughout his entire career. So I think you want to take advantage of your chances to throw the football at those two players, Cam Taylor, Britt, and Eli Apple. The other issue is, is for as talented as they are up front, and they get a good amount of pressure on the quarterback, they haven't gotten a lot of sacks. They only get a sack on 5.1% of dropbacks, which is the fourth lowest in the NFL. And so you feel good about Josh Allen and his ability to handle pressure. I think he's got the highest passer rating in the NFL this season when he's pressured. He's obviously phenomenal at avoiding sacks and extending plays, and I think you can lean into that against this team. Great defense, and it's hard to really poke holes in in it, right? But I think their corners right now are an opportunity. And the fact that they haven't been able to convert pressure into sacks at a high rate plays well for Josh Allen, who's good at avoiding sacks and good at extending plays. So what are my just additional thoughts here? I have written down four things. Number one, if you want to go deep, if you want to be a vertical passing offense that wants to stress the deep portions of the field, like we've seen the bills do lately, be mindful of Jesse Bates. That guy's a very good center fielder. He has really good ball skills, good range, good instincts. And so go ahead, launch the football, but be mindful of that guy because he can pick it off. And number two is lean into a more balanced passing attack. I want Josh Allen to throw the ball deep. I do. I do. I love that. That's what, Those are good plays. You got a big, strong, armed quarterback in Josh Allen. Throw it. I love it. I'm here for it, but perhaps be a little bit more choosy. If it's there, it's there. Take it, but don't be afraid to take the, the easy profits as well. Stay on schedule. I don't think you can have the types of lulls that you had really the last three weeks, Bears, Patriots, Dolphins. You've had, you've had lulls in all three of those games, and I think a lot of that's because the this, this style of offense you chose to play. Well, be aggressive, but also balance that out with 
taking some of that underneath stuff that is created because you have been so aggressive. And I like the conflict that this puts Cincinnati in this week from a game plan perspective. The conversations that they're having right now about the Bills' vertical passing offense and obviously adjusting from their most recent opponents, which have been the Ravens twice and the Bucks and the Patriots, very stylistically different team. And I like how the Bills kind of settle into this because they haven't had a lot of experience playing a team like the Bills offensively of late. I think that helps the Bills, and it puts the the Bengals in a challenging spot from a game plan perspective. Now, obviously, they went through a, a full week of game prep for the last Monday night game, and they'll do the same for this one, but just something to be mindful of when you consider how you can stress this defense and go deep, but also balance that out with a with a rhythmic passing game to go with your uh, your your deep shots. Number three, Mike Hilton, really, really good slot corner. Uh, and not only is he good at fitting the run, and he's a really active tackler, they'll blitz him a lot off the edge, and he's very effective at that. And I'm sure that they're looking at a lot of what Miami did with their blitz packages, and they're going to want to tap into that. I think Mike Hilton's the best blitzing defensive back in the league. And so that's something to be mindful of in your protection schemes this week. And number four is you are the two-dimensional team and you are at home. The Bills are every good as every bit as good of a passing offense as Cincinnati, but they can actually run the football. The Bills have a good rushing offense. The Bengals do not. And I think you you should really try to take advantage of that. Being a two-dimensional team at home, I think that helps you attack the defense in a more complete way. So there you have it. Those are my thoughts on the Bills, their matchup against the Bengals, what the Bengals do well, what their issues are, and kind of fitting the Bills into that equation. Tomorrow on the podcast, we will chat with the folks from Locked On Bengals for our crossover Thursday. Then we'll do our Friday stuff. So make sure that you are subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, share, and subscribe. We've we're a bit of a of a rating and, and review slump here. If anybody uh, hasn't left one lately, I'd really appreciate it. Go Bills, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.